All right, today, before we kind of move on, I want to uh, we go back and kind of do a little bit of a, uh, a little summary review here as we go through a couple of these things because I want to make sure that you get exposed to this a couple of times because it's, it's some important stuff. It's what kind of governs us for uh, the rest of our time in this class, of course, and of course still governs us today. So <clears throat> I want you guys to make sure, I want to make sure that you have uh, a clear picture about the Constitution, or especially how uh, the Constitution works and how it worked as we get into uh, Washington's administration, which is if you watch the lecture on Friday, you know, that's what I talked about on Friday. Now, I want to go back and just kind of uh, review the convention a little bit, talk about some of the things that you need to know going forward and how this plays into uh, what we'll continue to talk about. Because one of the first things that we have to do uh, as a nation is uh, actually change the document. Okay, That's one of the differences between the Constitution and the Articles is that the... Uh, the framers actually made a document that was uh, amendable, okay, unlike the, the articles. So uh, there are some things that happen that make the, uh, the document change and change pretty quickly. So we'll kind of talk about that in a second. Just so you know who was there, okay, a lot of people don't realize, for example, that Jefferson was not there. He's not. Is not a fan of what the uh, the group is doing. Patrick Henry, the give me liberty, give me death guy, is not there because he's not a fan of what these guys are doing because essentially they are changing the government. But Washington is there, which lends credence to uh, the meeting. Some big names are there. Ben Franklin is there. He's by far the oldest there. Alexander Hamilton is there. The... Uh, Several key figures, William Patterson from New Jersey, Roger Sherman from Connecticut, okay, or they're in Madison from Virginia is there, okay. There are, of course, several presidents on this list, okay. So, uh, two especially, Washington and uh, Madison are there and are on the list. So, what do these guys do, okay? In this meeting, really, in ultra secrecy, they craft a... Uh, a, a new frame of government. Most Americans okay, think that this happened easily, and it does not. Okay? The Constitution is full of compromises, and had these guys not been compromisers, this would never have happened. Best example I can give you are the two major ideas that are present going into uh, the convention. Okay? There are, uh, for example, if you looked at William Patterson's plan from New Jersey, he uh, simply wanted uh, the, the Constitution to uh, remain more like the Articles. Okay? The, uh, I'm going to take this off and put this on. Ugh. Second, the uh, the Connecticut plan that ends up being the compromise plan, it is uh, it's going to take really two big separate ideas, one favored by the big states, one favored by uh, the small states, and that's going to end up with us coming into and creating a constitution. All right. Take a look at some of these plans real quick. And if you watched the, and you uh, kind of did the, uh, the discussion, you saw some of these ideas, okay? The big state plan is the Virginia plan. Virginia is a big state. It has a big population. It feels like it deserves more representation than uh, the small states. It deserves a bigger chunk of the pie. If you take a, uh, the idea about government, and there are all these powers out here. And we've got to share it among uh, 13 states. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Virginia thinks that it needs a, uh, a bigger chunk of the pie. Because it's bigger. It has more population. So one of the things that Madison comes up with in his plan that becomes the Virginia plan 
is that big states need more representation in the national government. They need a bigger say. But that's the big idea. Okay? We'll talk about what representation uh, and what ideas Madison has about representation a little bit later on. But Madison also crafts what he thinks is a better uh, structure for the government. You would have a two-house Congress, a lower house, and an upper house. You would have a national executive and a national judiciary. The things that we said were missing from the articles. Remember that? There's no national executive. There's no national judiciary. And there was only a one-house Congress. Be careful, though. Look at what Madison proposes. Okay? You, uh, the people, would only choose members from uh, our members to the lower house. The lower house would choose the members of the upper house. The upper house would choose the national executive and the members of the judiciary would be chosen by that national executive. Now some of that stuff is still present in today's constitution. You guys are going to see uh, a new Supreme Court appointment after the death of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? So who appoints that person? The national executive does, the president. But that appointment will have to be uh, approved by uh, the upper house, the Senate. Okay? So there's some of this stuff that's still in there. Okay? But this was Madison's plan. The big deal, though, is representation. What Madison proposes is what's called proportional representation. The number of representatives will be proportional to a state's population. So uh, the winners would be big states like Virginia. Okay? They would get a bigger chunk of the pie. Now the small states, of course, freak out. And uh, they support all right, the New Jersey plan. Okay? We have Patterson's plan which is basically just almost an, an amendment of the Articles of Confederation. You would still have a one-house legislature. You would have a, nation, a plural national executive, essentially, and a national judiciary. So they would add a national judiciary. They would add a plural executive, okay, more than one, kind of a national executive office, office or board or whatever you want to think about it. Okay? The legislature would remain one house. But look at what Patterson proposed to uh, for voting in Congress, okay, representation in Congress. He says it doesn't really matter because what? Each state should what? Have one vote. They should be equal, like they were under the Articles. So it doesn't matter if Virginia should, sends 50 delegates and Rhode Island sends two. Those two delegates equal those 50 delegates because each state has one vote. Okay. Now this this threatens to tear the Constitution, well, to tear the Convention apart. Okay. So uh, they have to overcome this. Had they not overcome this, we would never have the document that we do. So the, the key here is compromise. What becomes the Constitution is a document of compromise. And Roger Sherman from Connecticut will uh, blend uh, the two things together. And uh, this becomes the Connecticut Compromise, because he was from Connecticut, or it becomes the, the Great Compromise, if you want to think of it that way. All right. The structure is pretty simple. Okay? The biggest blending occurs in uh, the legislature, which is Congress. Sherman proposed a two-house Congress, a lower house and an upper house. Okay. The lower house, the House of Representatives, as it would be called, uh, would be selected based on uh, population. For the past six months, you've seen nothing except things about filling out your census form, right? How many of you have seen that? Okay. How many of you have done that? Okay. Or your parents have done it? Okay. You're supposed to. Why? Because every 10 years, Congress must count the population. 
which serves to uh, show which states have gained population, which states have lost population, and therefore the number of representatives can be changed for each state based on uh, that population. Okay. All right. For the lower house, the House of Representatives was uh, will be selected by proportional uh, by representation. But the upper house, the Senate, every state is equal because every state has two uh, senators. That way in uh, 1789 when the first Congress meets and it's that way today. If you are from Mississippi, how many senators do we have? Two. If you are from New York, how many senators do you have? Two. If you're from California, the most populous state, how many senators do you have? Two. So in the Senate, every state is equal. Okay? So this is the big deal. This is where you see Sherman blend these things together. So the states that wanted equal representation get it in the Senate. The states that wanted proportional representation, they get it in the House. The rest of the plan borrows mostly from Madison. There will be a national executive, okay, and uh, there will be a national judiciary. And that becomes uh, the basis for uh, the Constitution. Now, they get over the hump of structure. But then uh, there are some other major problems that creep in, okay, huge problems that creep in. One is over slavery. Okay, the Constitution skirts the issue of slavery as much as it possibly can. The Constitution would never have uh, been put into place had it not been for the support of uh, the southern states. And those southern states are not going to accept any kind of government that outlaws slavery. And so slavery has to be dealt with uh, in a very, really almost obtuse way, okay? very opaque way. It's very difficult to find references to slavery in the Constitution. Here is one of them. It is called the Three-Fifths Compromise. It deals with how you count population. The South argued since southern states had a significant portion uh, or a significant population of African slaves, the South and southern states that permitted slavery wanted slaves counted for population, which would give them what? more representation in the lower house, more power in the government, okay? And there are, these estimates vary wildly, but it's pretty close. They're probably about a third of the people in the South, population in the South, last 33% of the Southern state's population were slaves. In some states, remember like South Carolina, the slave population outnumbered the free population. So, the South wants slaves counted for representation. Northern states who do not allow slavery aren't real keen on that idea. Uh, the argument is uh, that the South says that slaves are not people, they're property. So, how can you count property for population? Okay. So, after some haranguing, and uh, some really harsh negotiations, it was decided uh, that the slave population in the South would be counted uh, as the three-fifths compromise. Three out of every five slaves would be counted for population. So for those of you that are uh, percentage challenged, that's 60%, okay? So you take and count 60% of a, or you take and count all of a slave's population, or a state slave population. Okay, so let's say uh, that 
that you count 100 slaves uh, in uh, this particular state? How many of them count for population? 60. Okay. So that's how the three-fifths compromise works. It's one of the few references to slavery that you find in the Constitution because uh, it is a document that is trying to frame a government and without all of the states participating, that will never happen. And so slavery has to be dealt with uh, really tenderly in order to keep the southern states support. The supporters of the document from here on out, the people that support the document and support the ratification of the Constitution are going to become Federalists. They will call themselves Federalists. They support the Constitution. They will support the ratification of the Constitution. They will push the states to ratify the Constitution. And they will write, especially Hamilton, Madison, and Jay, they will write the Federalist Papers, essays in support of uh, the Constitution that will appear in newspapers and be read throughout the states supporting the Constitution. If, for example, you took a constitutional class, a, a constitutional history class, you don't just read the Constitution, you have to read the Federalist Papers. Because the framers, especially Hamilton, Madison, and Jay, they will explain themselves and explain uh, what parts of the government and what parts of the document they mean. It gives you a clear picture of what the document actually uh, means. So, after they craft the document, okay, these Federalists, they are going to be ones that fan out into the states and start trying to push their states to ratify the Constitution. And look, there's some very different names on here. Okay? Hamilton's from New York. Madison's from Virginia. Okay, you have a Southerner and a Northerner, both of them in support of the Constitution. Those that are going to oppose it are going to be called anti-federalists. The anti-federalists have a lot of objections to uh, the document that comes out of the convention and is submitted to the states. The most common objection by the anti-federalists and by the states that are hesitant to ratify the Constitution once it came out of the, uh, really, the committee was that it lacked a Bill of Rights. In other words, it lacked individual protections and freedoms uh, that, that are guaranteed in other uh, governments. Now, Hamilton's not a, uh, Hamilton did not believe that there was really a need for a Bill of Rights, okay? that the government was there and that the government would take care of uh, those rights. But some of the states are not convinced. And basically what they tell the Federalists and they tell Hamilton and Madison and others is that if we don't get a Bill of Rights, we are not going to uh, approve this document. And Hamilton will have to moderate a little bit. Okay? And instead, what he will begin to promise is that it will be the first thing taken up by the new government. And it is. Okay? It's one of the first things that will be taken up by uh, the new government. <clears throat> Excuse me. People that supported uh, the old articles tended to be anti federalists because they are afraid that, that this new government is too powerful. Federalists are uh, supporters of giving uh, the national government more power. The anti federalists want that power to remain with the states. They feel like that's the only place that it can be guaranteed. Okay. And so, Thomas Jefferson will be one of the leading figures among the anti-federalists. Okay, remember that these guys are arguing against the Constitution before it's ever approved. 
So they're not traitors. They aren't, you know, radicals. They have a different perspective. And of course, once the Constitution goes into effect, you will see most of these guys shut up. Now, they will still have complaints and they will still have arguments, but they will not protest or try to subvert the government. In fact, Jefferson is really pulled into the new government. Okay? All right. Keep that in mind. Okay? So, the document is submitted to the states. The states ratify it. Okay? And once the ninth state ratified, uh, then the new government went into place. And so the elections are held, and if you watch the, uh, the video from uh, Friday, then we know that we get our first president, Washington. I want to hit some of the high points to kind of go back and remind you uh, about what happens before, really, Washington uh, gets into power, okay? And I want to, you to kind of uh, I want to talk a little bit about this real quick since we just talked about Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Okay? Those two are going to morph into our first two political parties, our nation's first two political parties. Hamilton and the Federalists who supported the Constitution will also become really uh, representatives of our first, one of our first national political parties. And uh, Jefferson will become, he'll become representative of uh, the other one. Okay. Now, this is happening in the background. Everybody can see it happen. Washington is not a fan. Washington is not a fan of uh, these political divides. He feels it's detrimental. And so he tries to pull in representatives and members from both of these groups. He'll pull in Hamilton to his cabinet, but he also pulls in Jefferson. Okay? They are bitter enemies. They don't see the world in the same way. Okay? Is it a stroke of genius? Because it really uh, forces them to accept the new government? Probably. Okay. But the only reason this works is because the guy that pulls them in is Washington. Okay. No matter what, neither one of them really wanted to be the one that disappointed Washington. Okay. So Washington is such a commanding figure that none of them want to be that guy, okay, that makes Washington uh, angry, okay. But they are the ones that are really behind this, these two emerging political parties. And I want to tell you about each of them, and it's important that if you didn't get this in uh, the lecture on Friday that I put up, that we're going to kind of make sure you get it now, okay. They are opposites in many ways. The Federalists favor the Constitution and favor a strong central government. The whole reason for them writing the Constitution was to give more power to the national government and take it away from the states. Many of the powers the Constitution gave the new government some of them uh, were uh, before given to the states. So if you want to kind of think about it, the states in some ways under the Constitution are the big losers. They lose power. For example, the national government and Congress can declare war, can make peace, but also can tax can uh, regulate trade among the states, can uh, put in duties, import taxes, export taxes, okay, customs. So the power for the national government to raise money and tax is something that was not present before. 
okay, and regulating the states. Washington, Hamilton, Madison even, they tend to be uh, pro-British. A lot of you think, wait a minute, we just fought a war against the British. How can these guys still consider themselves to be uh, pro-British? It's easy. Okay? They still considered themselves to be of English stock. It's who they are. They didn't come from France. They didn't come from Spain. They came from England. And so, even though they had some political differences, it's still their heritage. And so, they tend to be more pro-British in their foreign policy. Okay? Hamilton is the leader, and Hamilton is pro-big business. Hamilton and the Federalists will believe that business is best. They also are dubious of your ability to govern. They tend to favor the elites. All you got to do is look at the structure of the Constitution. Okay? And this is what many Americans don't think about. Okay? The national uh, government and uh, the Constitution and the Federalists only trusted you to elect one office holder directly, and that is your representative to the House of Representatives. Under the original Constitution, states, state legislatures elected the senators. Okay? And you all, I hope, know that even today, we do not elect the President of the United States. Who does? The Electoral College does. Okay? So, think about that. You, as a citizen, you only voted in the original Constitution for one office holder, your representative to the House of Representatives. Everything else either came from state legislatures, was appointed, or is chosen by the remote electoral college. They don't trust us. We're uneducated. We're remote. Okay. And so uh, they tended to uh, try to place hands of, or place control of the government into the hands of the elite. Now, Jefferson is diametrically opposite. Okay? The anti-federalists are eventually going to kind of evolve into a group that we call the Democratic Republicans. We Sometimes we just call them the Jeffersonian Republicans. Okay? But they, of course coalesce around Jefferson. Okay. Now, remember, in the beginning, they were opposed to the Constitution, but the Constitution has gone into effect. But they can view the Constitution a little bit differently. Jefferson believes that powers belong in the hands of the states. That the best government is the government that governed the least. Okay. They don't like Jefferson and his followers don't like strong central government. They don't like big business. They tend to be more formal oriented. They don't like the British. They tend to be more pro-French because the French are the ones that actually helped us gain our independence. So they're a different lot. Okay? Keep that in mind. And it's one of the things that's one of the biggest hurdles in Washington's administration is trying to keep these two from bickering and destroying one another. Okay? And the only reason it doesn't happen, really, is because it's Washington. Now, I went over Washington's first and second administrations the last time in that lecture. Okay? But it's important. I want to kind of go back and tell you guys that it's important to know a couple of things. Okay? Number one, the cabinet... This is a group of advisors. Okay. By the way, these first four are still the first four. They're still the most important. Okay. And even though they've changed a little bit, okay. 
So our first Secretary of State was Jefferson. Our first Secretary of War was not. We don't have a Secretary of War anymore. What do we have? What? Defense. Okay. War was changed to defense. Secretary of Treasury, we still have that, and that's Hamilton. And, of course, we still have an Attorney General, and the first one of those was Edmund Randolph. The Cabinet is there to advise the President. These are executive departments. Okay? They carry out and help the President enforce the law. For example, the Justice Department is over up the nation's uh, most important law enforcement agency. What is it? Oh, good Lord. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. It's part of the Justice Department. Okay? So, they are, they are there to help the government enforce the law, which is one of the things that it's supposed to do. So, Washington's cabinet is very important. The cabinet is going to continue to grow. <coughs> okay? So, but there's four in the beginning. And I told you guys that the next big thing that Washington does is task Hamilton with dealing with the, the national treasury and dealing with, uh, really, the nation's economy. And uh, Hamilton is one of these guys that is a financial genius. Okay, For all of Hamilton's faults, Hamilton was... Uh, a uh, guru when it came to facts and figures, all right, dealing with the economy. So uh, Hamilton proposes, and Hamilton's fiscal plan, I told you about in that lecture, pay off the foreign debt, pay off the state's debts, pay off the debts that we owe to individual American citizens through bonds. So pay off the debt, okay, no matter what. So pay the state's war debts, pay the individual citizens, and then pay the foreign debt off. Okay, that's a ton of money. Okay, it's over, what, $40 million to just citizens, $25 million to states, okay, about $12 million to foreign countries. Okay, so uh, that's a ton of money in 1789. Okay, so... Hamilton says that this is the only way that we are going to build full faith and credit in the United States. That we don't welch on our debts, that we don't welch on our debts to foreign nations, we don't welch on our debts to uh, individuals. Now, I want you to think about that. There are a lot of people that said we should just write this off. That those debts were incurred by a former government that doesn't even exist anymore. We just shouldn't even pay them. Okay? Whoa. Okay. Hamilton says, no way. we got to pay them. And it leads to a lot of bickering between him and Madison and Jefferson, especially. And really, the only way that Hamilton gets the support of uh, Jefferson and some of the southern states, especially Virginia, is that he agrees to move the nation's capital from New York City to the Potomac River into a district that would become the District of Columbia. And of course, you know that we'll name that Washington, D.C., and that will become the nation's capital. And the Potomac divides Maryland from Virginia, and so that, that really national district is in the South. Trivia question. How many capitals has the nation had? What was the first? Where's Washington sworn in at? Everybody thinks in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. didn't exist. Okay? Where's Washington sworn in? Where's our nation's first capital? Just told you. New York. Okay? Where else? In the interim, it would, before it can move to Washington, D.C., where will it move to for several years while Washington, D.C. is being constructed? Nobody knows. Good Lord. Philadelphia. Okay. So it goes from New York to Philadelphia and then to Washington, D.C. All right. Pay off the debt. That did not go well. That does go well eventually. Okay. But 
this is the one that I will talk about a little bit because if you don't understand this, you have a real problem kind of figuring out what happens a little bit later on. <coughs> Excuse me. Hamilton proposed creating a national bank. Okay. And it causes a huge rift between himself and Jefferson. Hamilton believed, and he had written about this in the Federalist paper, so he doesn't just pull this out of the ether somewhere. Okay? Hamilton believed that parts of the Constitution were there to give flexibility. And one such clause in the Constitution we today call the Elastic Clause, or uh, sometimes it's called the Necessary and Proper Clause. In the first article that deals with Congress, there is a clause in the Constitution that says Congress can make any law necessary and proper to fulfilling its duties. Okay? And what Hamilton believed is that gave Congress flexibility that it could make law rather than uh, us having to do amendments all the time. Okay? Passing a law is much simpler than changing the Constitution. Okay? And so it gave the Congress elasticity. Okay? Now, Hamilton proposed the creation of a Bank of the United States to help the nation manage its money. Okay? Hamilton is absolutely right. Okay? In fact, this may be one of the best things that Hamilton does. Okay? You want to know how good it is? A couple presidents down the road here Jefferson will be elected president. Does he tear up the Bank of the United States, which he hated, which he despised, which he didn't think was constitutional when he becomes president? No. Why? Because it's working. Okay? So why would you tear up something that's working? He didn't like it. He didn't think it was legal. He also didn't think it was constitutional, but... If it's working, we're going to leave it alone. Okay? And he did. But Jefferson never thinks that it is, uh, that it's correct. Okay? All right. I also talked a little bit about foreign policy. Okay? So if you go back and look through that lecture, you'll see uh, Washington's foreign policy with France, with Britain, and with Spain. Two of those things lead to treaties. That stuff's really important. Make sure when you go through that, you take some notes on that. And I told you guys about the Whiskey Rebellion. I already kind of told you guys a little bit about the Whiskey Rebellion. That some farmers in Pennsylvania decided they weren't going to pay the tax. Washington raises an army and goes out there and threatens to shoot them all. And guess what? They pay the tax. Okay? Enforcement. The president will see the laws of the nation enforced. Okay? The old government couldn't do this. See Shays Rebellion, for example. Okay. Washington can and does. Okay. And it, it really signals a big change. Okay. Told you guys a little bit about Washington's deal with uh, the Indians. Okay. Battle of Fallen Timbers and Washington's Farewell Address, which you all sort of need to go and kind of take a look at. If you've never read it, it's really, it's really interesting. It's one of my favorite documents. I remember in high school, my history teacher made us read it, and uh, in some ways, it's sad. I mean, it's a it's a hero saying goodbye and giving you a little bit of advice along the way, which we don't follow. Well, we follow some of it. So, all right, here's the deal. Okay, for the first part, for two terms with Washington, and now in 1796, we have our first real contested election with John Adams. That you have uh, a you have the Federalists in charge, the guys that had created the Constitution, the guys that had uh, that support the Constitution, the guys that are uh, pro English, the guys that are uh, <coughs> big business. But in 1796, the field is wide open. Okay? Washington's not going to run again. So who's going to become your president? Everybody knows who's going to uh, run from the other side. It's going to be who? Jefferson, right? Uh, so we already know that. 
But who's going to run for the Federalists? A lot of people thought it was going to be Hamilton. But there are constitutional questions about Hamilton. Why? Wasn't born here. And the Constitution says you have to be a uh, natural born uh, American, right? Well, technically, none of the first presidents were natural born Americans because America didn't exist when they were born. Does that make sense? So, uh, could Hamilton have become president? Uh, tough call. Okay. Hamilton is going to try to avoid that and actually run a, a, a candidate that he thinks he can control. And that will be Hamilton's sort of favored candidate. But elections in these early days aren't like they are now, where the parties sort of uh, coalesce around one candidate and say, this is going to be our guy. That, that hasn't happened yet. And so uh, while Jefferson, everybody knows that Jefferson is going to run, the Federalists actually end up offering several candidates, including the nation's vice president, John Adams. Now, Hamilton wasn't a big fan of Adams because he didn't feel like he could control Adams like he could... Uh, some of his own, like Thomas Pinckney, who's the guy he sort of favored. But the uh, the election of 1796 is uh, one of those that it's really our first contested election. It also is going to expose our first real electoral flaw. Everybody, a lot of Americans think, oh, the Constitution is perfect just as soon as it's passed. Nope. That not. And this is one of the biggest problems that the Constitution has is how we do elections. They have to really work at this to get this fixed. All right, we'll stop there, okay? So you guys, what you'll see on Wednesday is Adams. We'll talk about the Adams administration on uh, Wednesday, okay? So that's the... Uh, the thing that you'll be watching, and then we'll be ready to start talking about Jefferson on Friday. Okay, all right, see you guys. Mm -hmm. <coughs>